Welcome, everyone. I'm Seth Glasser, joined as always by my partners, Joe Kosum and Sean Riney, for our quarterly policy update with our friend from CHIP, Jay Martin. And today we are also joined by uh, another friend of ours, Ms. Christina Smith. Welcome, everyone. Thank you guys for being here with us. Um, goals for today, we're going to talk about uh, what happens next with CHIP after not hearing much uh, from the Supreme Court on HSTPA, the case against HSTPA. We'll talk to Joe and Sean about what's been happening in the multifamily market since we last got together about 90 days ago and what we're seeing over the last couple of weeks and kind of looking forward throughout the rest of the year. Jay and Christina will give us an update on a lesser known case against uh, effectively HSTPA, but 74 Pinehurst versus the state of New York. And we will go over some other policy updates, the Regina bill, good cause eviction, unit combinations, uh, et cetera. So we also wanna hear from you guys. We're gonna talk for a little bit, but we're certainly gonna open it up to questions and feel free to put the, your questions in the chat and we will answer them towards the end. Uh, those will be private only to the panelists, so we will address those at the end. Quick background on the group. Uh, since our inception, we've sold about $8 billion worth of real estate. We typically sell about 100 apartment buildings every year in New York City. And just a trend that we're seeing kind of looking forward, we kind of get like a sneak peek of what's happening in the market before it actually happens. But here's quarter over quarter. So uh, from last quarter, the opinions of values presented or BOVs is down about 10%. New listings that we've taken on as a team is down 28%. And transactions put under contract is down 25%. So this is all um, negative changes as compared to the previous quarter, Q2 versus Q1, which is almost all positive changes. We kind of felt that um, towards the end of the summer, really starting right after July 4th, kind of getting to that lazy summer mode with uh, com combining that with rising interest rates, as well as leading to the Supreme Court taking or not taking the HSTPA court case, kind of led to a bit of a slowdown in activity. Um, but over the last couple of weeks, we've kind of noticed people getting back to work and, and the activity certainly has been picking up. And we're going to hear right now from Joe and Sean about what's been happening over the last couple of weeks and kind of what their predictions are moving forward. So it hasn't really all been dead. Sean, I'll let you kind of take this here. Um, we've put 14 deals under contract recently. Thanks, Seth. Uh, yeah, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah, the the activity has been down a little bit on the new listings and under contracts, mostly because of a pricing disconnect. Um, but but we were able to secure a couple larger transactions, which which put us almost to a quarter billion dollars in contract or close in the last sixty days. What is selling is typically in two categories. It's either all free market or all rent stabilized. Uh, the the buyer pool that uh, we've been speaking to of the quote unquote hybrids uh, that that asset class still kind of lacks an identity. So land is selling, condo conversions are selling, all free market buildings are selling, all rent stabilized buildings are selling, but there is a lack of the 50% rent stabilized, 50% market rate buildings that are transacting. And I think it's basically just because they lack a clear uh, a buyer identity. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of slides. Um, this package on 111th Street, this is actually a, a three really nice buildings on top of Central Park here. These have been owned by the same family for about 30 years. They actually um, did an HPD rehab program on them. So they removed, you know, lead, mold, did the repiping and stuff like that about 25 years ago. And these are going to sell um, for probably you know, a little over $100,000 a unit right around the corner from Central Park, all rent stabilized, $1,300 rents. Um, so someone here is just going to own the bricks in a premier location in New York. So why now are they deciding to sell? Um, good question. It's been, you have multiple 
generations involved in the family discussions. And, you know, when you get someone who's um, 70 years old and then you have someone who's 50 years old and, you know, the buildings only make so much money because they are unstabilized and they do have debt on them. You have an expiring tax abatement on them. So over the next handful of years, the properties will cash flow less. And at a certain point, like these deals just run out of a life cycle where everyone is on the same page and they're just looking for, you know, to be on a, uh, a different side of the fence and just move forward. It's nothing, it's nothing really more than that. They're just looking to get into the next phase of their life. Yeah. Speaking of a uh, fun cycle, this is uh, an ex a new opportunity we're very excited about. This is the first time I'm actually speaking about it. Uh, this is on the ocean uh, in Brighton Beach. Uh, it's 228 units, asking 7.3 times the rent. These are asking 33 million were purchased in 2014, 10 years ago, 10-year fund uh, for 43 million, and then a significant amount of capital expenditures were put into the property. So if you're looking to time the bottom, uh, which some buyers are recognizing, maybe we're at the bottom 20% of the rent stabilized cycle, uh, this is a great time to get involved. You know, properties are properly underwritten today. Uh, it's a 6.3 cap cap rate at asking price with 54% expense ratio, uh, average rent of $1,600, obviously very good real estate. Um, you know, again, there's, there's, it's always darkest before dawn. And I think the, the rent stabilized buyers that are buying in today's market are, are trying to time the bottom quartile. They're not necessarily trying to time the absolute bottom. Uh, and this so, is a really exciting opportunity if you're one of those people. So I think this is just, I, I just want to talk about this for a second as the market as a whole. So this is an institutional seller that bought the building uh, for $10 million more than they're going to sell it for. And oftentimes you hear in the market when we talk to the private clients like, oh, I'm not an institution. I don't have unlimited funds. I'm just little old me. Well, this is an institution. Um, why, are, why is whether uh, it doesn't have to be this institution specifically, but institutions sort of generally, we've noticed that some of them are bringing properties to market now. What's been happening, um, Sean? Um, why are they saying, okay, let's cut bait? Well, it's two things. One, it's a little bit of debt. You know, debt maturity is just coming due, and that's the seller profile of a lot of people. Uh, but setting that aside, this is a 10-year fund. It was bought in 2014. Next year is 2024. Simple as that. That's simple. Got it. <laughs> all right. Willow Street, 29 Willow Street. Not yeah, also a, very, also a very exciting opportunity if you're looking for A++++ real estate. This is 10 units, protected tax class, 90% free market, 90% vacant. This is one block from the Brooklyn Heights promenade. Um, unbelievable real estate. Essentially, you know, on a lease up, um, on and on as is terms, I think you can probably get to right around a six percent cap rate. So that's buyer pool number one. Just release them and as is condition. The building's been very well taken care of by the current owner that's owned it for twenty years. Uh, option two would be to re-renovate all the apartments and go high end rentals, or option three would be to condo the building. The basis is, you know, roughly. $920 a square foot at the asking price. There's a similar building that we sold in years past, almost the same square footage as currently selling condos out at uh, 15.8 million. So there is a there is a delta here. There's a number of different food groups that are looking into it. But if you're exchanging, this is a great exchange property. Um, again, it's just A++ real estate and it actually cash flows. Historically, you can never find one of these for a four and a half cap in place. Uh, so six cap with upside, not having to do anything, I think is quite quite an appealing thing. Oh, huh. nice. All right, Joey, what's going on over here? So back to now to Manhattan. So we uh, we successfully executed two portfolios in the East Village. Uh, what's selling today, in my mind, is anything with assumable debt with four to six years left on the debt. This one, uh, these two pools had about six and a half years uh, left at 3.7% interest only. Uh, so 248 units in total. The first two pools have been uh, uh, spoken for, uh, and we're selling a very similar pool uh, with lower uh, interest rate on the debt. And these are all trading between five and a half and six caps. So real uh, attractive double digit cash on cash returns. Uh, and these are all in the East Village um, on 9th Street and on 13th Street. 
Did you just right. say double digit cash and cash? I did cash? say that, Sean. Okay. And I, think, sure I think that should have woken a lot of people up because, you know, like you said, everyone's waiting for the bottom, but this is a real opportunity to, to get in on the bottom and buy these properties where maybe the basis is not as low as some of the, you know, as what you're you know selling in Brooklyn on their rent stabilized properties, but these are 80% market rate buildings with attractive debt in place. Um, so this is yeah. some moving to you're basically saying you could earn a 10% cash on cash return as a result of the debt. So if you have six and a half years left on the debt, you're going to get 65% of your money out of the deal before your debt matures. So and that's before you raise any rents. Correct. And this is a seller that's looking to exit the market and uh, busy outside of New York. Um, you know, obviously operations is challenging in New York City. I know we're going to learn more about that later from our panelists. Uh, however, there are a lot of reasons why people are coming into New York because the returns are better than outside. Yeah, we've we've gotten um, we've we've executed or have come close to executing several transactions with assumable debt. Um, so if anyone has anything like that that they want us to talk about, feel free because that's like a little bit nuanced and some is some can be executed on and some is a little bit more challenging. So we can go take a deeper dive on a building by building basis if that's interesting to anyone in the audience. Um, last Another one here, assumable, Joe, really yeah. quick. Also a symbol of that, that 13 building portfolio, eight of the 13 buildings, these are all located in Chelsea, um, are tax class protected. So this is an attractive portfolio where you're going to buy with $75 million of debt. So anyone that has a, a 1031 exchange, an equity requirement, uh, could assume the debt, get the new depreciation on the debt that's already in place, which I think is very attractive in today's market. 147 units. Um, and... Uh, you know, talk about clean buildings and great locations, potential conversions of single family houses down the road. Um, and this is being sold as a portfolio only. Um, and, you know, the reason this seller is selling today is he's uh, there. This group is specifically buying larger assets and this is smaller in their portfolio. But this is a real opportunity for a new group to come into the market and get real scale in, in this sub market. Yeah, Which, nice, uh, you're really reading nice some, blocks. Yeah, Chelsea. you're reading some headlines that rents are, are down a little bit in New York City, uh, but really it's seasonal. And overall, rents are still high, and especially in this uh, market. Okay. And I'll go quick through this. This is an yeah. occupied four-family condo execution, bought for 700 a foot. Condo sell, it's probably 1,500 a foot. So again, the basis was about 50% of the condo sellout. Uh, this was one of the few hybrids that we were able to get in contract. It was roughly in contract for a 6% cap rate with two rent stabilized tenants on the ground floor. So again, if you're out there asking, are there buyers buying at negative leverage, buyers buying at six caps, you know, in a 7% interest rate environment, the answer is yes. You just have to have the right thing. Uh, but every building's nuanced. That's why you got to call us. There are negative leverage cap rate transactions going on. Totally. All right. Jay, Christina, without further ado, welcome. Thank you both for joining us. We really appreciate it. And again, as a reminder to the audience, if you guys have any questions for any of the panelists, please put them in the chat. And I promise we will get to as many of them as we can. And I, um, uh, I got to put my sunglasses on because the future's so bright, according to <laughs> I'm There's the positivity we were looking for. Thank you. Now talking about i can't believe you're even able to speak to us because your phones should be ringing like crazy i love, I love you christina that's that, great thank you that beach run i'm gonna call you when we hang up about that that sounds that, like a deal that's funny all right yeah. all right let's let's start with jay here because the big news um kind of came out about two weeks ago uh the supreme court didn't hear our case against hstpa so jay why don't you tell everyone you know, what's next for that lawsuit in particular? And where where do we go from here? Thanks, Seth. Appreciate it. Uh, good to be here, as always, with you guys. Always appreciate you having uh, voices that uh, aren't always positive, but uh, help kind of frame the realists, uh, re realism that's going on in the market for your, for your customers. So, uh, yeah, it was disappointing that the Supreme Court did not take up our search challenge, uh, which is essentially appeal to lower court rulings um, uh, to our facial challenge to the, to the rent stabilization law. 
we knew this was always going to be a difficult road uh, when you file an appeal uh, as a facial challenge as an organization that represents many, many property owners. Uh, you're trying to go for as most the, the widest uh, relief as possible. So you're not really using a very specific case and fact pattern to attack the law. Uh, but we felt it necessary for this to be the first step against the RSL. Um, there is no doubt, um, I think, certainly among myself, but amongst the attorneys that we have been working with on this case and folks that we've been speaking to around the country as we've raised money and, and uh, support. We had 13 Amici uh, uh, submitted in support of our lawsuit that this law is unconstitutional. It is just a question of asking the right question in front of the U uh, U.S. Supreme Court that will put us in a position to strike down parts of it. So our next step is to be working with the industry and working with other owners to come up with those very specific fact patterns of very specific aggrieved classes of individuals who can then file individual lawsuits as opposed to a, a broad facial challenge to, as applied challenge they're called where the law is very specifically affecting the operating income and valuations of the buildings themselves. Additionally, um, we have been working with owners and we're going to be encouraging owners, uh, current owners and potentially future owners to submit what are considered hardship claims under the current system. Um, right now in the entire city of New York, despite the, the devaluation post 2019, which is uh, to your point and Christina's point actually presents an amazing buying opportunity for a lot of people. In fact, there has probably no been no better time uh, to invest in rent stabilized properties in New York because one way or another in, over the next few years, if you have enough dry powder to sit on the building, um, this law will change, whether it be through regulation, uh, through legislation, or through uh, through the judicial process. It is unconstitutional. It cannot stand, and it won't stand. Um, the, process, the, the, the timing of this and how long somebody can wait out, I think, is the question. So uh, the hardship claim application is relatively simple, um, but in the entire city of New York, only three were filed last year because they are so often denied, folks don't believe that they would qualify. That is part of what we need, though. We need people to apply and be disqualified, not, not get uh, those hardship applications granted so that we can show the ridiculousness of the, the parameters within the hardship claim. How, how difficult is it to file a hardship application? What, it, what does it entail? Like... I don't think it's anything that we've talked about previously, and it's not something that we kind of see um, in like our mainstream day to day as uh, something to do now. So easy. what does it entail? It's, it's pretty easy. It's about two pages. We're, we're, we're in this case, we're looking for folks to file the alternative hardship claim. It's called, um, and we can get you documentation which you can send out to your email list. And uh, we're actually having a webinar next week that will also get you information on. Um, to walk people through the process of applying. It's relatively simple. Um, it's, it doesn't provide any information that the Department of Finance doesn't already have, but it, it kind of draws their attention to say there is an issue here and, and um, that the amount of revenue that the owner is allowed to charge on the regulated units is not covering the operating expenses. And the, the number is 95%. So if you're not, if you're not, if you're being covered more than 95% on your, um, you're not covering the 95% requirement under the hardship claim, then you could qualify because that threshold is ridiculous. Um, and you could does, still be losing money on your expenses. Do, um, does that like open you up for an audit or I'm trying to think like why? So the answer is no. people, right. Are they like airing their dirty laundry or personal information out to the public for scrutiny? Like I said, there's nothing in the hardship claim that the Department of Finance doesn't already have. So um, it's just putting it into a form that they you flag for them to say, I want to be considered for this. We are expecting most of the applicants to be denied. In fact, that's what we're going to be using as a fact pattern to say that the RGB doesn't even have an outlet system for folks who are being had have, have their revenue taken under this current regime. So that along with many and, and again developing those fact patterns of individual uh, legal challenges, this is not over by any means there's also and I know we're going to touch about it a little later. There's two other court cases that are have not yet been denied, we believe they are continuing because they had 
uh, as applied parts um, as opposed to ours, which was broadly facial. They have broadly facial as well, but they also have specific as applied complaints within theirs uh, in their lawsuit. So the court has yet to rule on those. We're waiting every week. Court on Monday comes out with new potential cert grants. On Friday, they come out with the, the potential cert grants. Um, denials on Monday, potentials on Friday. So look, one way or the other, the law is going down or being amended drastically. The question is when and how long. Yeah. Um, and of course, we don't want it to be any longer than it has to be, but that was this was an important first step that had to be taken. Um, and we're disappointed, but we're we're emboldened to continue our challenge and through through broad lobbying and legislation and through our legal challenges. Yeah, eventually we'll get we'll get somewhere. We just have to in order to do B, you have to do A, and we kind of just got to keep pulling on the string and figuring out a system that works. But why don't we, since there are two other cases here that have um, not yet been heard by the Supreme Court, um, can you share sort of from a high level what those cases are and how they're different from the chip court case? What and they why? mean, what them not yet answering means is that a not, whole time? Yes. Yeah, I mean, what it means is that they're still in consideration for being taken up. They're they're very much still in the game. Um, there is speculation, uh, no no facts, and whether or not from the attorneys, both representing seventy four Pinehurst and our attorneys, who are communicating that perhaps there is a uh, decision, but that there is uh, a, a opinion being written in opposition that would also give. Um, the our industry a legal foothold for future challenges uh, if the cert is denied there's uh, a lot of uh, you don't really know what's happening with the court until they actually do it so um, the the positive is that it's not they're not dismissed the negative is that they have not taken up any any um, significant property rights claims uh, this long session is what it's called so uh, but it is clear, um, and this has helped us, it is clear that the court is very interested in as applied claims, and they're looking for victims. They're looking for people who are directly aggrieved by the law. Uh, they want to attach a name to the complaint. Uh, and that is our next step, and that's what we're going to be pursuing rigorously. Got it. Is there... So back to the Pinehurst case, it's broadly the same arguments, but they're, they're using very specific complaints um that we use um uh to with 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 um complainants in in the in the in the challenge that are tied directly to the the legal challenges that they're putting into so it's a it's a little bit more specific in the in the way that they approached it but it's roughly the same uh complaints with the law um if they are granted cert it kicks off what is a will be undoubtedly another multi-month long perhaps year-long process in which the second circuit will then review. Uh, it's unlikely that the court would strike down the law in the cert decision once they eventually hear the cert decision. So it is a next step regardless in the process, but either way, we're not stopping. Do we have a timeline on when that will? No timeline. No timeline, okay. Could be, could be any, who knows, yeah. Okay, all right, Christina, why don't we talk, I wanna just pivot kind of for a second here because um, you and I have been talking a little bit about what's been happening in housing court. So I thought it would be interesting for the audience to hear from you about um, kind of any type of movement. I know people typically bang their head against the wall trying to deal with evictions and rent collections and stuff like that. But why don't you give us a little bit of insight from your view of what's been happening over there? Absolutely. So I am in housing court daily, weekly. My firm is in housing court. Um, you know, I'm sure there's lots of owners on the call who are frustrated with the speed with which they can get warrants of eviction. Um, and then how many orders to show cause can a tenant file before they are actually evicted. Um, it's important to state at the outset, right, that a tenant, for the most part, a tenant has one obligation, and that is to pay rent. And since the pandemic, you know, enforcing that obligation has been made almost impossible for owners. Um, you know, this isn't to 
you know, gripe about how slow the housing court is, more so to talk about some of the solutions that I see happening. Um, you know, every LNT attorney who is worth, you know, their license um, participates monthly in a Zoom. Um, it's typically about 300 practitioners and there's tenant advocates and landlord advocates, but the most important people on the Zoom are the um, chief judge uh, in the boroughs, right? The chief of Manhattan and chief of Brooklyn. And those guys, they are guys right now in Brooklyn and Manhattan, Judge Stoller and um, uh, Judge McClanahan and Kings. So they're there and they're talking to us about why there's a backlog, what can be done. They take Q and A from practitioners. And in one particular instance, the, um, Chief Judge in Kings took back about 90 cases from a judge who, for whatever reason, was woefully in, inefficient um, in getting her cases moved along. And so he, he finally listened to us getting on every day and saying, hey, listen, I submitted a motion for summary judgment last January. I still haven't gotten a decision. You know, there are all rules about how long judges have to write decisions, you know, and more and more and more of these, and it filtered down to be about the, the, right, the same judge. Oh. And so he took those cases and he did what needed to be done. He doled out decisions and orders and things like that. And, you know, for me, I can walk up and down the halls at 111 Center Street and all of us are complaining, like, this judge did that. And, you know, in a very recent decision, and I did want to make everyone aware of it for the stabilized owners, it used to be that if a stabilized tenant fell behind on their rent, but also had an expired lease, stabilized lease, you could sue them for the rent. But about a month ago, in a decision called the Fairchild, um, the I'm not sure the second part of the decision, but the Fairchild decision basically says that you can't maintain a non-payment proceeding against a rent-stabilized tenant who does not have a lease. Now, this is very onerous for owners because stabilized tenants often don't sign their lease because there's an increase involved, right? The RGB oh. increases. And now we have yet another hurdle, right? It used to be that a stabilized tenant was statutory. They would go on whether they had a lease or they didn't have a lease. Now to the stabilized owners, you know, on the call, you have to be vigilant about getting stabilized leases signed, countersigned and returned to your stabilized tenants, period. Because you- so yeah, is deeming a lease still the thing. I just remember, you know, usually I, I just remember deemed leases, sending certified mail. Does that not constitute an absence of a signature? Constitute a lease, and that was one of the things. Thanks again, HSTPA. You're just the gift that keeps on giving. But no longer can we deem leases. Um, so a tenant could be sitting in an apartment having not signed a lease since 2019, and guess what? It's on the owner to start a holdover. And this is what I was told three weeks ago in Queens, your tenant's lease expired on 531. You started the case in June. You cannot collect this rent. Your case is dismissed. And I said, judge, how do I now go and start a holdover when I'm not gonna get a date in court until the end of next January or February? But anyway, again, that's my problem and owner's problems. You have to start a lease non-renewal holdover and demand that the tenant sign a lease, period. So if it's your property managers, I mean, I know you guys own, you know, if it's your property managers, they need to be knocking on doors of tenants in a non-threatening, non-harassing manner and saying, this is your right. You're a rent stabilized tenant. You need to sign your lease renewal. If you don't sign your lease renewal, we're serving you with a notice. And that's the way it goes. So that's one of the sort of new, um, new things going on in housing court. And then, you know, again, I can't stress it enough. Your l and practitioners, the ones who are out there doing it and working it are doing it the right way. We have to work together. 
to collect this rent or these buildings are never going to survive. I mean, that's, you know, yeah. Uh, have, have you noticed, Christina, I know, um, you know, a lot of landlords, you know, they'll fight for a year or whatever it is to get the rent. And then the tenant shows up with a check from some type of housing agency for yeah. like the entire year's worth of rent. Uh, is that still happening or less? Where's the money coming from? Stuff like I'm that. Exactly sure where the money's coming from. There are certain certainly caps on how much one shot will be approved you know one shots get approved if the tenant can show future rent future income right you have to have a job essentially to get a one shot um which is a good incentive right does, a, gonna... does being a professional tenant count as a job yeah there's a certification <laughs> program i think for that now <laughs> uh, nyu or something they run a program how to become a professional tenant but yeah. <laughs> In any event, so yes, one shots are happening. Um, here's another new development, and I'm not sure if this is city council, could be city council. There used to be a requirement that you had to be in a shelter before you got an HRA uh, rent assistance, rent subsidy. If you were never in a shelter before and you need rent assistance, you're not getting it. So. Like, okay, do we want to send people into shelters for a week and then they can get their HRA? But anyway, that's phasing out in January. So for owners who are counting on city FEPs or HRA, your landlord tenant attorney is telling you, yes, they're going to qualify for city FEPs in January. Just hold on. You're going to get your entire monthly rent covered going forward. That's actually true. They are phasing out this prior shelter um requirement you know now this is very granular but i can't un overstate it enough if these rents are not coming in these buildings cannot sustain themselves this is what i'm screaming about every march april may june on the rgb so yeah rent collection becomes costly but also an absolute necessity i would say boots on the ground with your managing agents you know Call the tenant in a non-harassing, non-threatening way. Try to keep the, the case out of court if you can. Do agreements with tenants. Get the rent in so you can run your buildings. Are there any ways, landlords, like any incentives that, that you you know that landlords can implement to get them to sign the lease? Right, we're getting a lot of questions. Why should a tenant sign a renewal if they're aware of this new case? That they can sit there and not sign a renewal, but they are going to get hit with a new lawsuit, a holdover, right? And a holdover in some instances is not curable, right? If you're a nuisance tenant, that's not curable. There's a way that we can serve a notice that can't be cured, right? The, the conduct is so egregious, we're not giving you another chance. We've already given you eight chances. But with respect to tenants, for sure, there are gonna be stabilized tenants who just refuse to sign your lease. And guess what? They're getting a lawsuit, period. There's no other alternative. Have you noticed anything or like, or do you have an opinion on this? Maybe is a better way to say it. Um, uh, where are, where this type of like, uh, where the migrant crisis and the homeless crisis is impacting what you're seeing in housing court and some of the policies being implemented. Is there any pattern emerging there or any relief for the industry maybe is a better question as a result of the migrant and homeless crisis? I mean, I'm sort of leaving the housing of the migrants up to Mayor Adams with these hotel contracts. I don't see it really impacting in housing court because the, you have to ask ourselves, like, how did they get into these apartments to begin with? Right. Yeah. They're not they're not in our our apartment, so to speak, because they would have to qualify for that to get. I mean, unless they're squatting, which could be happening in greater, greater quantity. Um, but I wouldn't say I mean, certainly legal aid will come and they will say that the reason that evictions are up and so on and so forth could have something to do with the migrant crisis. But I would absolutely say that that's not true. I mean, in my spare time, I will do a study on the repeat offenders, you know, and prior history doesn't mean future um, law 
infractions and breaking the law, but it, you do really see the same tenants over and over who just simply can't afford to live in New York City. Yeah, well said. Are there, I think, you know, just from like a, the simplest perspective of what most landlords are probably kind of scratching their head with, like everyone that we've spoken to has some warehouse rent stabilized vacant apartments. And are there any strategies, like what can people do to actually rent these units out? And, you know, Jay or Christina, either one of you guys can answer this, like, other than renting it out for $83 more than the last legal rent, what strategies are there for people to actually get some rent on some of these apartments? Well, as you know, we just, if we, as we have discussed in prior webinars, we have been pushing for a legislative solution on this for um, starting last year. Um, we've been doing a, a, around a press operation for several months. Um, the bottom line is it, it's about it educating and the more lawmakers that we inform about the punitive nature of the HSTPA, the more we start to get uh, support for the, for the bills and the legislation. Um, it's a fact. The New York lawmakers, by and large, don't know the economics of the properties. They generally assume that the average rent stabilized property is is uh, minting money. It's just a, a bank of resources. And so that the rents on some units, when they're regulated well below their operating and well below their cost to renovate, um, uh, don't matter because the other units in the building can simply cover those costs. And we know as rational business operators and people who are investing in properties that the the costs have to pencil out so yes uh we're seeing upwards of thirty thousand vacancies at a minimum caused by the law itself a lot of people are sitting on those units uh we are pushing for a solution that would allow owners at a minimum a bare minimum to accept rents as high as the uh the regulated voucher amount so ami bans across the city at a minimum um, to get all those rents, basically raise the floor on all rent stabilized rents across the city um, and allow obviously owners to have the working capital on those rents to then invest. Uh, going back to the prior IAI system is not something the legislature seems interested in doing. They have proposed as early as last session, increasing the IAA, IAI up to $30,000, but again, still prorated. So on a monthly uh, basis that's still not enough liquid um, revenue to help an owner uh, finance or have the income to do the renovations. Um, there is talk, they, they are uh, as much as putting together half a billion dollars in revenue or resources from the state for owners to draw down on and res renovations up to $100,000 a piece. I'll believe it when I see it, but that's how far they're willing to go to prevent an owner from raising the rent on these units. Yeah. To me, though, know, it's an acknowledgement of the problem itself. So there, once we get them to acknowledge that it's a problem, it's only a matter of getting them to the right solution, and it's a matter of time. So I think we're going to get there. Yeah, it's almost like the housing stock in New York is slowly going to get to, like, like the truly free market housing. And then anything that's rent stabilized is going to have some type of government strings attached to it as a result of them supplementing the landlord to raise the rent because they don't well, want to put the burden on the tenant. I mean, that is actually the basis of all these lawsuits. Um, yeah. when you get to the, if you get down to it, the basis of the lawsuits um, and the argument against the rent stabilization system as a whole is that the government is coming in and it's regulating affordability, but it's not providing a subsidy for it. And our argument is very simple. If you're going to demand affordability, if you're going to regulate it, then you must compensate it. So either the renter has to pay the difference between what the operating cost and the regulation is, or a third party has to pay the difference. Either way, the property owner is not responsible for the difference of what the affordable rent is as regulated and what the cost is to provide the housing. And uh, once that is this determined and uh, established either in the minds of the lawmakers or in the court, then how we get there is the solution that we, we, will, we will settle on. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So let's open just, it. Hold on, Seth. I just do yeah. want to jump on one thing because um, Jay mentioned it, but the combination, you know, the the repeal of Regina and 
the kind of elimination of an incentive to combine impar- apartments. What's the latest there? You mentioned that it's probably not a good idea to be combining apartments because it seems like through DHGR or uh, in Albany that they are going to you know enforce that you really can't add you can't you can't combine an apartment and get more than the previous two last registered rents. Is that a correct statement? Yeah. So November fifteenth of last year. So coming up on one year, the um, DHGR had a uh, uh, a public hearing on rules that they had promulgated, which essentially uh, said that if you take two full units and one's free market and one's rent stabilized, you can combine them for a new rent of the combined rents, but you can't set the rent at a free market. It doesn't create a new unit. Um, that hasn't been in effect yet, but that was what the rules proposal was. Um, also, it, it determined how much of both of those you had to put together to determine a fr- a, what would be considered a new unit of housing. If you take two rent stabilized apartments together, you can create a new first rent, but it's still regulated and it's still capped. So th- what happened was at the end of session, the legislature passed two bills. Uh, they did a lot of damaging things, those bills. Um, one of the things they did was defined exactly what the rules had been proposed by DHCR. And the other two things that those two bills did is they reversed the Regina decision on the look back period, um, essentially ending it in perpetuity forever, um, opening an owner up to uh, potential overcharge complaints for the life, uh, uh, the entire life of the building. So the good news is that we've had very good conversations with lawmaker with uh, the governor's office. Uh, we don't believe they are inclined to support um, the the extensive rollback because of the massive regulatory problems that that would create and legal problems uh, and financing and pricing problems that that would create for rent stabilized buildings. They are, um, as DHER has promulgated the rules, um, still um, entertaining letting the rules portion. So what they can do is veto parts of the bill and work on chapter amendments on other parts and let parts of the bill go forward. And they may do that with the unit combinations, which means uh, if owners have combined units over the last few years, that those are fine. There is no retroactivity in the bill language, but essentially going forward, um, that ability to increase the rent or get a, a new unit of rent will be strictly drastically curtailed once those rules or the law is put into place. Okay. And when do you, when do you expect to hear some type of so? Uh, the legislature has not sent the bill up. They have 30 days. The governor has 30 days to veto, sign, or chapter uh, when the bill gets sent up. It hasn't been sent up yet, and we're coming up on, let's say, mid mid October now. So, you know, 30 days from whenever it goes up. So if it goes up November 1, December 1, if it goes up December, then January. If she does nothing on these bills after they're sent up within 30 days, it's what's called a pocket veto, and the bills die on their own. So uh, it, it is getting close. Uh, we don't think the legislature and the governor have engaged in any conversations, and this is simply the part of the process in which, because it was passed late in session, they're getting through the entire uh, legislative back roll of bills that have been put forward, but that's where we're at now. Christina, how are you advising clients on these topics right now? You know, I just sat with a client this morning who finished a duplex. Um, you know, you have to you have to do what's best for the building. Would I advise someone to start swinging hammers on combination apartments today? Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Just- and if you do have one ongoing, the letter of completion from DOB, I believe is probably the defining thing of you completing the job. So that's at least what the buyers when we're selling these buildings look for, um, get the letter of completion. So finish the work, get the letter of completion. Uh, Joe, we've got, a bunch of questions here from the audience. Why don't sure. you start going through some of these? Sure, we addressed a, a few. Um, if you want to, uh, Jay, if you could just talk about the other case that's out there as well, um, besides the Pinehurst, right? There's there's one other there, one. Oh, I mean, 335-7 and 74 Pinehurst, I mean, they're, they're very close. O- owners who have um objection to successor um tenants because that's forcing an owner to rent to someone that they didn't originally rent to um you know that they're 
that's essentially what went on with 335-7 is there, you know, it's, it's owners with specific scenarios, why HSTPA hurt them and why the RSL hurts them. Um, you know, in a strange twist, I'm actually named um, as a defendant um, in the Pinehurst case because the, the owners sued the RGB um, because the, you know, and, and, in a, it's a strange sweep. Obviously I would never advocate, you know, I'm, uh, against an owner who's being harmed by the RSL and, but the, um, my participation on the rank guidelines board, you know, put me in the hot seat there. So I probably won't say much more, but it's just important to realize that there, there are owners you know, specifically a hundred of them are on the call right now who have been harmed by these laws. And like Jay said, either it's going to come because the Supreme Court's going to give cert or we're just going to have to keep fighting our own battles here. You know, you know, this, this Fairchild law, and I know there's some other questions about Fairchild, what you do, what you don't do, but this is unbelievably shocking right because we participated in a world where if a stabilized tenant doesn't pay their rent you can sue them they're statutory tenants they have a life estate in that apartment why now all of a sudden do we need a renewal in place this is brand new and it's getting challenged left and right already you know it was a housing court decision but it's controlling um, you know, there was a question there, I think about, you know, can you do it? Can you start a holdover when there's a pending non-pay? Your non-pay is getting dismissed. If you have a judge who reads the law, your non-pay case without a lease is getting dismissed. So you're left without any choice, but to get a signed renewal in place. That should answer one of your questions, Joe. Thank you. Uh, this one's for Jay. You seem very confident that the legislation will change either uh, either by legislators or in court. Why so confident in the SCOTUS decision? After SCOTUS decision. I'm sorry, after. Well, um, I, I, we'll put you on the hot seat there, Jay. Is the FDIC calling you every day wondering why the signature pool of rent stabilized loans are worth fractions on the dollar? Is that why? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one reason, and there are many reasons. But the <laughs> like the, the question is, it's a good one, and uh, it's asked by a friend of mine, uh, someone who I know is a great operator and owner of property. So, uh, with respect, uh, I say this: in 2019, when the law passed, there were about five lawmakers who genuinely knew what the true impact of the law would end up being. Five of the hundred assembly members and the uh, 42 state senators and the one governor who dared the legislature to pass it. Um, we are now coming up on four and a half years out. The full breadth and scope of the impact of the law on the housing market has been seen. We've been able to highlight it. Um, and now more often than not, when we talk to lawmakers, they are there's an acknowledgement of the detrimental effects of the law than there is and i've seen that i've seen that change from 2019 on uh and it's gathering steam and momentum as the mar market gets worse and unfortunately it just it takes that to happen for lawmakers to pay attention um and i i think it's really important to look at the scotus decision uh, in in isolation in the in the fact that it, it is a denial of an appeal to a lower court's decision. It isn't necessarily a ruling on the merits of our lawsuit. So the other side has been, the other side, and when I, I'm very specific when I say this, the Legal Aid Society in particular and other groups that have a vested interest in seeing this law be perpetuated, uh, they look at the denial of cert as a win um, because they think it's a validation of the law itself. It isn't. And uh, it shouldn't be viewed as that. What it is viewed as is the court is deciding not to intervene in a lower court's uh, decision. That lower court, by the way, happens to be ultra liberal, uh, the Second Circuit, um, and the folks that we have to deal with and go through the court system. The difference, I think, with different as applied, um, if we are to take them up and when we take them up with very specific cases, 
is that they're they're viewed much more in a vacuum as opposed to broader ramifications and impacts on society as a whole, which is essentially was as applied challenges. So I think uh, in and of itself, you get a better and fairer hearing on the law's applications then. And secondly, to the lawmaker opinion, the worse it gets for us, unfortunately, the the better it gets for our ability to impress upon the lawmakers how bad the law is. There are, I know, a mountain of conspiracy theories that the lawmakers work together to try and do this, to take property rights away. Look, there are a class of socialist demagogues in the legislature. They don't actually have the power. They don't have power. They don't have the ability to pass a bill. They don't have the ability to control the legislature. What, what's happening is a confluence of different ideologies and mostly lawmakers who don't understand the ramifications of bills that they're passing. And with education, time, and forceful lobbying, we will get them to understand that they must amend this bill if we are not able to change it in court. Yeah, that was going to be my question, because uh, we have a lot of people uh, who are basically just like still in disbelief because the concept of just supply and demand and like, it's really simple to everyone on this call um, about the ramifications of the law. So they, I think most people want to know, like when you have these arguments and debates with some of the politicians and you explain to them this simple math of how this works and you show them pictures of old apartments, like what do they say? Like how can you not acknowledge that the law was completely detrimental and hurting the yeah. people that it was actually intended to help like what do these people actually say because it's they say the owner should have kept the unit maintained during the 50 years of occupancy they should they should have led, led abated it when the person was in tenancy they should they say that the owner is making enough money on the building they should be putting the money back in anyway renting it out at a loss um again it's simply a, a complete yeah. misunderstanding of the of the environment the uh, economic well-being of the building and the detrimental effects it has to other renters. Um, we actually had the housing chair and the assembly tell us, well, just raise the rents on your free market units to cover the losses. And it, it, actually encouraging us to raise rents. At the same time, speaking out the other side of our mouth, having a press conference saying rents are too high in the city. I mean, that's the ideology we're dealing with. So yeah. So yeah. how you you mentioned that um, some of the people that actually voted for this uh, liberals and progressive have i don't know if you would call it maybe an admission of guilt but have sort of acknowledged the impacts the negative impacts of the law is there any scenario where maybe you get them to actually help draft some new bills that can actually implement change where they can go to friends on their side of the aisle and actually get stuff done that can be extremely helpful to us 100%. Well, we have no choice. We have to do that. And we're getting there um, uh, for the survival and well-being of the industry and, and many people's livelihoods. So that's what we're doing and that's what we're going to do. Um, and I think we are going to get there. Um, I'm not one to kind of speculate on. I'm not considered to be overly optimistic. <laughs> um, it I'm, depends on the day. Some days yeah. you really are. Uh, I'm realistic and I'm realistic that we, uh, because of the detrimental effects of the law and our ability to, to translate that to lawmakers, uh, we will get change eventually. All right. Sounds good. Well, well we, um, yeah, we appreciate your efforts, Christina and Jay, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's in the shadows. We know all of the fights, so we appreciate it. And we do think you're making progress as well. I can, I can also feel it. Yeah. Thank you for your time here today as well. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Always good to see you. And if and, anyone uh, wants to reach out, everyone's contact info is right here on this page. And feel free to reach out uh, to Jay on all the good work and Christina that they're doing. And thank you. To the chip cocktail party. Yes. yes. Yeah. Chip cocktail well, party. We Remember send that out. And Dan, the question from a guy named Dan, I can answer that offline for you. Thanks. Take care. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See everybody soon.